Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers, now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Everyone facing criminal charges is supposed to get an attorney regardless of their ability to pay. But then, who foots the bill? We're currently out of money. We have $505.02 left to pay public defenders, and that's through the end of the year. Ahead, we'll take you to a county where leaders are up against the wall. They're out of money, but cases keep coming in. It's been 50 years in the making, but finally this week, city leaders and residents from two Indiana communities honored Carol Jenkins Davis, who was stabbed to death in Martinsville in a racially motivated crime. And there are efforts to nearly double the size of the state's longest trail. It's a big undertaking led by a tireless group of volunteers. It's like going to a door and asking, will you give, uh, let us walk through your, you know, tomato patch forever for nothing? Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. And Indiana County is nearly out of money to pay its public defenders through the rest of the year. There's only about $500 left in Hancock County's public defense budget for 2017. Barbara Brozier has been reporting on issues with the state's public defense system for months. And Barbara, we're not just talking about one county. Uh, well, that's right, Joe. Funding is scarce for indigent defense across Indiana. That's because the state doesn't guarantee a set amount of funding for counties to provide those legal services every year. It's one of many problems legal experts say is contributing to an overburdened system. And that was about 97, almost $98,000. John Apple has been in this situation before. We're going to need, in my estimate, another 125000 For the past three years, Hancock County's Public Defense Board has gone to the county to request additional funding to pay for attorneys who represent indigent clients. Apple says a variety of factors are contributing to the problem, including a murder case that cost the county more than $50,000 this year. And there's been an overall increase in the number of cases making their way through the court system. I think we, we have a systemic problem that's for funding across the board, all the way from law enforcement to the courts, to the prosecutor, to the probation department, public defense. Counties across Indiana have little help from the state when it comes to funding their public defense systems. According to the nonprofit Six Amendment Center, more than three quarters of the funding comes from local governments. Counties can opt into the state's public defender commission and receive partial reimbursement for representation costs associated with felony and death penalty cases. But the amount they receive varies year to year. It would be great if we could get reimbursed on everything. It's one of several issues a new statewide task force on public defense will look into. The group is made up of attorneys, legislators, judges, and public safety officials. Their job is to draft recommendations for improving Indiana's system. The right of due process is one of the most important rights we have, so we need to get it right. Funding will no doubt be part of the conversation. A Sixth Amendment Center study from last year found public defenders in many Indiana counties are taking on caseloads that are much higher than state standards. In order to come into compliance, many counties need to hire more public defenders, but they're already struggling to pay for what they have. This is one of those um, sort of societal unfunded mandates. The county can't really do a good job of budgeting of how much money they're going to need for public defenders because you just don't know what kind of crisis may happen in your counties. That's the situation Hancock County finds itself in year after year. Apple says while caseloads climb, the public defense budget remains the same. 
He's hopeful that will change, but it's unclear where the county will find the necessary funding. He says the shortfall could be addressed in part by the state contributing a set amount of money toward public defense each year. And it isn't like that's unprecedented. The, the, the judges and so forth, their salaries are paid for, or at least mostly paid for from the, through the state. But it's an option Apple admits is a long shot. The Hancock County Council will vote on whether to allocate an additional $125,000 to the public defense budget at its November 8th meeting. And the state's public defender task force will also look into issues with pretrial justice in Indiana. A report released by the Pretrial Justice Institute this week gave the state a failing grade for its pretrial detention rate, lack of a validated pretrial assessment, and its use of monetary bail. All right, thank you very much, Barbara. Enrollment is now open for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act, and Hoosiers have fewer options for coverage than previous years. Only two providers are offering plans on the marketplace in Indiana this year, and many counties have only one option. Health insurance consultant Christopher Schrader says that's one reason the much shorter open enrollment period won't have a huge impact. So that's a shorter time period. However, with only one carrier and one plan, the choice is really, do you want insurance or not? Uh, so it's, it's a very straightforward process this time. Indiana is also facing 82% less funding for health care navigators, the people who guide enrollees through the process of signing up. Schrader says many enrollees are familiar with the process and don't need as much guidance. But, he says, anybody new could be facing the challenge alone and with a tighter deadline. Even if there isn't really any choice, and even if that part is really straightforward, any new process is challenging for anybody uh, new. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. Last year, close to 175,000 Hoosiers enrolled in health care plans through the Affordable Care Act exchange. Open enrollment for 2018 coverage ends on December 15th. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. The state of Indiana could make more than $39 billion in tolls between 2021 and 2050, according to the Indiana Department of Transportation. Potential toll rates could range from $0.04 cents per mile for automobiles to $0.19 cents per mile for heavy trucks. A law passed this year requires the Highway Department to perform studies and seek approval from the Federal Highway Administration for tolls on the interstate routes. But the same state statute mandates new toll lanes on an interstate highway must be at least 75 miles from an interstate highway or bridge already subject to tolling. The study did not take that into account. Governor Eric Holcomb is calling on Congress to permanently repeal the medical device tax and soon. He penned an op-ed saying doing away with the measure is urgent because a two-year suspension of the tax expires at the end of the year. The multi-billion dollar life sciences industry in Indiana has been pressuring Congress to do away with the measure since it went into effect with the Affordable Care Act in 2013. But previous attempts at a repeal have failed despite bipartisan support. The need for adoptive parents is growing in Indiana for the more than 23,000 Hoosier children in foster care. Officials say the rise in cases coming through the Department of Child Services is linked to substance abuse disorders. Indiana DCS Director Mary Beth Bonaventura says awareness of the need for foster to adopt families is imperative. So we need really good foster homes because we have more children in care than we've ever had nationwide, but, as, but in Indiana as well. DCS has completed more than 1,800 adoptions so far this year, up from a little more than 1,000 three years ago. That follows a sharp increase in the number of Hoosier children entering the foster system, often because of opioids. The University of Notre Dame will stop providing birth control coverage to students and employees at the end of the year. Contraceptive coverage is required under the Affordable Care Act, but a recent decision by the Trump administration gives religiously affiliated organizations an exemption. Uh, it, the employer, if it wants, can simply refuse to provide the contraceptive coverage altogether if it cites a religious objection. 
Notre Dame sent letters to students and employees outlining the changes. Birth control coverage for Notre Dame faculty and staff ends December 31st. For students, the coverage ends August 14th, 2018. A legislative panel avoided endorsing a proposal to eliminate Indiana's law requiring a license to carry a handgun in public. Rather than make a specific recommendation for the legislative session that begins in January, the panel voted to back the removal of what it calls licensing hurdles. The panel suggests better tools to identify people with mental health issues and improve access to resources. Several police organizations have supported keeping the current handgun license licensing rules. A recent study says people suffering from cystic fibrosis have a high risk of chronic pneumonia. The Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis study says that mucus builds up in the lungs and allows bacteria to rapidly grow, which increases the risk of pneumonia. A thin, slimy substance called biofilm protects bacteria from cystic fibrosis, pa fibrosis patients' immune systems and antibiotics, making the bacteria hard to kill. They surround themselves with a matrix of polysaccharide and DNA and protein, and it provides protection from them from being eaten by uh, predators in the environment. Anderson says this is one of the first times scientists have identified a link between a protein in the membrane of bacteria and what causes biofilms to form. Cystic fibrosis patients who suffer from infections can experience breathing problems that can lead to serious strain on the lungs and heart. The Monroe County Community School Corporation could consider redrawing its board district boundaries at the request of several members of the public. MCCSC hasn't updated the boundaries in more than 20 years despite the community's growing population. It's not just the populations that I'm hoping that are looked at by a committee, but is the system that we're currently using the best possible system for the fairest possible process? The board plans to vote on whether to form a redistricting committee to further explore the issue at its next meeting November 14th. After three Bartholomew County jail officers were injured in September, officials are reinforcing cell doors in the facility. During that incident, officials say an inmate kicked out a portion of his cell door, tore apart the bottom, and threw metal rods at the officers. Sheriff Matthew Myers has attributed the disturbance to overcrowding and not having enough staff or operational space. The county recently approved funding to hire additional guards. The new head of the Utilities District of Western Indiana says his focus is on moving the co-op forward. Doug Childs will take over the electric cooperative November 20th and will have the big job of rebuilding trust with ratepayers. The issues that have happened in the past, uh, I'm going to tell them, which is, which is absolutely factual. Look, I'm hired to move uh, the utility forward, and I'm going to try to keep on that. The co-op has been plagued by controversy this year. The board of directors fired CEO Brian Sparks in June amid allegations of money mismanagement. The FBI is also investigating the electric utility. Child says he plans to get out into the community right away to meet with members and hear concerns. He says he's already begun reviewing co-op policies and the internal structure and is thinking about some changes. A Scott County doctor on the front lines of treating Indiana's HIV outbreak two years ago says he's frustrated to see syringe exchange programs throughout the state becoming politicized. Health officials credit Scott County's exchange with saving lives. We do hepatitis C testing, we do HIV testing, we do education. While the number of new HIV diagnoses has slowed since the Scott County outbreak more than two years ago, Dr. William Cook's work in the community hasn't. He runs Foundations Family Medicine in Austin and spends a lot of his time out of the office, taking his mobile unit through neighborhoods and surrounding communities. I see a lot of different factors still that are affecting the situation. We've come a long way, but we have a long way still to go. Cook considers the county's needle exchange program one of its biggest successes. It became the first in the state after then-Governor Mike Pence declared a public health emergency in Scott County in 2015. 
Since then, legislators have approved measures making it easier for other counties to start similar programs. But they're coming under fire in some communities. Both Madison and Lawrence counties decided to discontinue their exchanges earlier this year, citing community opposition and moral objections. Cook says given the medical evidence that supports syringe exchange programs, it's disappointing. The access to clean needles decreases the spread of HIV, decreases the spread of hepatitis C, both very expensive infections to treat. By not having a needle exchange in a community, we're allowing that, those infections to spread and we're increasing the cost to that community. The Centers for Disease Control says multiple studies illustrate that impact. Cook says engaging people through syringe exchanges also increases their likelihood of being connected to treatment and other medical services. More than 200 people in Scott County are living with HIV. Cook says he is glad President Donald Trump recently declared a public health emergency to combat the opioid crisis, but says it won't make a difference without significant funding dedicated to the effort. Well, this year's unpredictable weather means the state's corn harvest is still 10 percent behind schedule. The wet spring and long planting season, coupled with an unusually warm fall and the recent rain, means the harvest season is getting longer. Farmers could get back on track if the state experiences a dry spell over the next few weeks. And Indiana Dunes is one step closer to becoming the country's 60th national park. The U.S. House approved a bill this week, sending it to the Senate for consideration. The National Park designation would be for the 15,000 acres along the southern shore of Lake Michigan. The bill sponsor, Representative Pete Visklosky, says making the dunes a national park would help draw tourists and increase the number of visitors. And so many people, that's their annual vacation, Joe, here yeah. in Indiana, going to the dunes. It'd be well-deserved, beautiful area. Absolutely. Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Indiana hikers could have nearly 150 miles of uninterrupted trails to hike if one volunteer group gets its way. Plus, how IU storied soccer team is taking its broadcast to a whole new audience. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. 20, 18, 5, 24. It's at least 40. Look, dude, look at 40, it. 4,500,000. 650. 20. 650. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way. I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. This week, city leaders and residents from two Indiana communities honored Carol Jenkins Davis, who was stabbed to death in Martinsville in a racially motivated crime. The 21-year-old's death went unsolved until police arrested an Indianapolis man for the murder in 2002. He died before the case could go to trial. Martinsville city leaders dedicated a maple tree and an engraved stone in Carol Jenkins Davis' honor. Her family was there too, including her sister, Laura Davis. I want everyone to take home exactly what I said, which is Carol's challenge to them is to love somebody that's different. During the ceremony, Hoosier Harvest Church pastor Chris Page denounced racism and urged Martinsville residents to do the same. From this day forward, we declare Martinsville to be no longer a city known for racism but instead known as a city of refuge. Welcome to all. Jenkins Davis was from Rushville. Earlier in the week, city leaders there renamed a park in her honor. Rushville Mayor Mike Pavey says the park, formerly named Community Park, will be redesigned as a place for people to reflect and learn. 
the park as it sits today is kind of probably a little bit of an antiquated design from the 50s, so we're trying to upgrade it into a new concept park, a park that has um, art, uh, sculpture in it, it has a, a trail. We want that trail to have stations that tell about Carroll's life. The mayors of the two cities collaborated to hold the events. The Knobstone, the Knobstone Trail is Indiana's longest hiking trail, and people often use it to train for the Appalachian Trail. One hiking association is leading an effort that would more than double the length. As Sophia Salaby reports, there's ongoing work needed to complete the project. On one of their monthly trail work days, Knobstone Hiking Trail Association members worked to extend the original trailhead at Deem Lake State Recreation Area in Clark County. Volunteers are clearing brush and pushing away dirt to clear a path. You try to refine a path that will be sustainable where you can not go straight up and down, which will just be creating a, an erosion gully. Mittenthal is a trail designer and founding member of the Trail Association. She started it about five years ago in an effort to extend the length of the Knobstone Trail. Uh, I heard about this long distance trail that had been started in the 70s, uh, the Knobstone Trail, and I'd always heard about the thought they might be able to extend it all the way up to, uh, it turns out, Morgan County and the state forests up there someday. The Knobstone Trail is named for the Knobstone Escarpment, a slope formed through erosion separating areas of different elevation. That's what caused the trail's rugged terrain, which is characterized by steep hills, or knobs. It's, it's unique terrain in Indiana. You don't expect that kind of topography in our state. Pajic was a streams and trails specialist with the State Department of Natural Resources in the 1970s. Part of his job was to find a location for a long distance trail in the state. So I started looking at the deed ownership maps that DNR has, so looking at just everything that we owned. And the most extensive ownership was the state forests. And when you started looking, you could see a real pattern. The original Knobstone Trail opened in 1980. It runs about 60 miles, starting in Clark State Forest near Louisville. To extend the trail to the proposed 150 miles, the plan is to link it to the Tecumseh Trail. It's 42 miles in Morgan Monroe and Yellowwood State Forest. The big issue is there's about 50 miles between the two trails. And while the association has acquired some of that land through easements, there are still about 20 miles not yet part of the trail. What it takes to get landowners to take the public spirited decision to allow strangers to pass on their private acres for nothing. It's like going to a door and asking, will you let us walk through your you know, tomato patch forever for nothing? Not easy. There's no word yet on when those easements will be acquired, but talks are happening. Knobstone Hiking Trail Association members are hopeful, and in the meantime, they have plenty of work to do in both the top and bottom thirds of the trail. We have ongoing repair rehab on the original Knobstone Trail. We're also working at the other end and hope to be working soon on some of the uh, new miles at the top end that I mentioned connecting to Morgan County. One of the volunteers today is an Indiana University student. He's been hiking on the Knobstone Trail for years, and those experiences made him want to give back and help build the trail. You can walk from Martinsville to Louisville, basically. So you have all these communities connected, which is really cool, and um, they all have these, this opportunity to get out on this trail and enjoy the, the um, benefits of nature, which is really great. Having young people like Shear involved in the trail and the extension efforts is something Pajic and other early trail supporters never imagined when they first started planning the trail. It was uh, Joe Payne and I's dream, you know, way back when, you know, back in the 70s. And uh, I know, you know, we both are excited that people have taken up the mantle and actually want to do it. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. The DNR currently manages the completed sections of the trail and volunteers are critical in the trail's maintenance. A new program is bringing Spanish language coverage to IU soccer fans. As James Vavrick reports, expanding the audience for one of the best college soccer teams in the nation is the goal. Indiana University is taking a new approach to broadcasting men's soccer games this year. The university is offering a Spanish radio broadcast for selected games. 
Senior Associate Athletic Director Jeremy Gray says it's the first time soccer broadcasts have been offered in a language other than English. I started up looking around and trying to find people to do it and then it turns out that there was a student in the media school um, who uh, comes from a Spanish-speaking family and uh, wanted to be a sports broadcaster and was really excited about the idea of calling the games in Spanish. The program was born out of IU President Michael McRobbie's idea to start a Mandarin basketball broadcasting program during the 2015-2016 season. Gray says the success of that program led McRobbie to suggest starting Spanish broadcasts for men's soccer. We have the greatest college soccer program in the history of the sport. And so to be able to add another layer of interest in something that we're doing that nobody else does is especially appealing. The athletic department plans to continue and grow the Spanish soccer broadcast program after Juan Diego Alvarado graduates. He hopes to lay a good foundation for the program. This was my one, one of my other goals to like set a good uh, set a good base for for the next Spanish broadcasters. I don't want to be the first one and the last one. I, I want to be the first one in many. The broadcast can be accessed on iuhoosiers.com. For Indiana News Desk, I'm James Vavrick. And that's the end of this program. More online at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers, now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org the IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members, thank you.